So, hello everybody and welcome and welcome to our guests. Thank you so much for coming in today from far and wide. Some canceled flights, some made flights, so thank you all so much. Um, and I'd like to thank the students as well. How many here are not Ryerson students? Please, please let there be a bunch. Yes! Well, I'm not talking about the older generation of students. I'm talking younger generation of students. Uh, but thank you all, and, and Ryerson students, thank you for being here, and thank you to all those that came uh, from other universities and colleges. Round of applause for all of them, our young, young hopeful members. So today's uh, presentations are really geared to help you, the younger generation, understand uh, some of the topics we've been covering over the past few years. Uh, they're hot topics, they're important topics, and uh, we brought in leaders in the industry to help you understand a little bit about them. Uh, over the past little while, some of my students and others have probably attended. I'd say ga gaining about uh, 5 to 10 percent knowledge through some of the sessions that we've had uh, because of the level that the speakers sort of uh, interact with uh, each other in the audience typically. But today, like I said, is geared towards you. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, somebody you know very well, Tony Miracker. Oh, I forgot to give you a bio, and the bio, sorry. You have to know a little bit about Tony. Aside from being chair of, uh, of SIMTI of Toronto, Tony has more than 40 years, you wouldn't think he's even 40 years old, but of experience in technology, broadcasting, and post-production industries. He currently works for his own company, Miratech Systems, as a consultant to media, broadcasting, and post-production technology companies. And as I said, is Simpty Toronto Chair. So now you can welcome Tony. Thank you. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about Simpty. It might be uh, a little boring, but it's going to be good. Uh, but before I can answer the question, why SIMPTI, I need to go back or move ahead and say, well, what is SIMPTI? So a lot of people may not know what SIMPTI is. And the official SMPTE stands for Society of Motion Picture Television and Engineers. And um, in today's age, that might not be the correct, but with the SIMPTI, we stick to the, the Ackerman that was put together back in uh, 1916. But it's a global volunteer driven, everything here that we do, we all do voluntarily, driven society of technologists, developers, and creative, passionate about advancing the art, science, and technology, enabling the future of motion picture, television, professional, media, which is a big mouthful. But it's, it's a, a uh, organization that um, definitely tries to move things forward from a technology point and all of the video and audio and internet that gets moved around. There, we do have a mission, staple, a mission statement, which is enabling the technical framework of global professional community that makes motion picture television and, and professional media available for all humanity in, uh, to enjoy the uh, artistic, educational, and so social purposes. So um, it's, um, it's very recognized, SIMPTI. We, SIMPTI itself, has been awarded one Oscar, nine Emmys over the course of the years. They have published 823 so far standards. Uh, we'll talk about a, a little bit more about that later. And um, they have published two, tw over 23,000 journal articles in their magazine. And journal articles are uh, uh, topics on various uh, components of this business. And a lot of them make my head spin because they're very technical. Um, so Simply has three pillars. We have a membership pillar, which is uh, the uh, getting everybody together um, and uh, to uh, exchange ideas, meet, uh, talk about uh, future uh, technologies. We have an educational pillar, which we, uh, similar like tonight, we're going to uh, 
I'll put an educational spin on this so everybody can walk away uh, learning a bit more than when they came in. And the last one is standards, and that's what started SIMPTI pretty well many, many, many years ago. And we'll touch upon each one of those in uh, brief details. So on the membership front, globally, we have over 7,000 members in 62 countries. Uh, there are 30 sections or chapters. Toronto is a section. Montreal is a section. 30% um, are outside of the uh, North America continent, and 14% are students, which is a, a good number. On the Toronto, sorry, on the Canada side, we have Toronto section, and we have a subsection in Western Canada. So in in Vancouver. We have 405 members plus 64 students. And if my math serves me correctly, that's 14%. So we're right on par with what uh, is happening worldwide. Montreal section has Ottawa as a subsection, and they have 262 members and uh, 50 students. Now they have a meeting on HDR happening tonight as well in CBC Montreal. Uh, one of the things, uh, there are some, what I would call heavy hitters. Uh, Hollywood has a big section. If not, um, I should have checked, but I think they have more than one. Chicago and United Kingdom all have big sections. And what they have there, or what they've done as well, is they've done, similar to this section here, they've um, generated student sections that are uh, within the universities and colleges. So um, this is something that we would love to talk to Ryerson about or Centennial College. Uh, we've had some opening conversations with Centennial College just to say, you know what, is there interest to have your own student section? And again, similarly, you would meet half a dozen times or two times a year and just bring topics to the table. You would have the same, you'd have a board and things of that nature. Um, so, sustaining members or sponsors, corporate sponsors, I guess. Uh, there's the list of some of them. Apple, Netflix, all the big players, Amazon, Sony. So you can see the list. Uh, so the, the SMPTE as a whole is very important to a lot of people. On the educational front, uh, Home Office, which is in uh, White Plains, New York. Um, they produce the journal, and the journal looks like this. I still get print copies because I'm a touchy-feely guy. So if anybody wants to see these, you can uh, afterwards come and grab them. Uh, they have virtual classrooms uh, on a regular basis. They have monthly webcasts, and they have podcasts. So again, to the theme of education, they just um, every month is a different topic, and you can uh, join in um, with your membership. Um, they also have conferences, like we are going to do in June with our technical conference, uh, a two-day thing. Uh, they have the fall conference in Los Angeles. Um, and this year was kind of, this year, sorry, last year was kind of neat. They actually had um, speakers from NASA. And um, those speakers had a little bit of pull. So they did a live link to the, uh, the uh, space station. So for about 15, 20 minutes, they were talking back and forth between Los Angeles, a convention hall in downtown Los Angeles, and the guys up in space going around 20 miles an hour, uh, more than that. But it was pretty, pretty cool. So if you want to see the video, just go to the SMPTE website and, and search SMPTE uh, Fall Conference, and you'll see the link, and uh, it's quite interesting. Um, HPA, which is the Hollywood Post Alliance, uh, they get involved in. In fact, they are uh, now managing that arm. Um, IBC, which happens in September in uh, Amsterdam, that's the European show. NEB, which we talked about earlier, which is in uh, Vegas. And uh, Australia has a uh, fall, sorry, summer conference similar to the fall conference down in Sydney. Or I don't know if it's in Sydney, Sydney every year. Alan, is it in? Every other year? Every, gotcha. 
So in Toronto, on our section here, we have monthly meetings. It's usually the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, these are some of the meetings we had just this past year. Uh, January, we were at CBC. March, we were in uh, here, and we were talking about IP ar ar architecture. February is missing because that happened to be the snow day that uh, Ryerson closed its doors, so we couldn't have the meeting. But that was a big storm, if I'm not mistaken. I remember. Um, April is the NAB wrap-up. May it was uh, AI and machine learning. Now, this is the part that I like. <laughs> I love the music, David. <laughs> I'm not a technoid. <laughs> so anyway, these are the t-shirts that um, the Ryerson students, or the students that go down to NAB. And I can tell you now that the... Sorry, Ryerson. So, if you didn't know that yet, well, you do know it now. Sorry, Rick. Um, the camera that I took these pictures and the projector doesn't do it any justice at all. They are loud. <laughs> Kids are trying to get a hold of you. <laughs> uh, June and December, which are members only meetings, we had June, we were at the uh, Weather Network and we learned all about um, how they localize weather, uh, which is very interesting because you can be in a hotel in Brockville and see the local weather of what's happening there. And in December, we were at Blue Ant Media, which is um, one of the, uh, they own College Life and uh, they have Hi-Fi, Smithsonian Institute TV channel. But it was an interesting uh, uh, event as well. Now this is our technical conference. Uh, again, two-day event, June 11th and, uh, and the 10th. Um, and these are some of the, our theme is going to be media fast forward. Um, and these are some of the topics that we're thinking about, talking about. So if you at all find yourself in the middle of the summer with two days off or wanting something to do, uh, this is definitely a good uh, venue or event to uh, join. On the student front, it's uh, $15, so it's a, what, two Starbucks, three Starbucks, maybe. So standards, this is the other uh, thing that is important, um, is... Um, as is mentioned here, SMPTE standards touch nearly every piece of motion imaging content consumed by billions of users around the world, ensuring the content is seen and heard at the highest quality and on any display. Um, it's, it's, again, as it mentions here, it's, it's, it allows for repeatability of workflows. Um, there is a, um, SMPTE had a, uh, a 1916 uh, or uh, sorry, 100 year, 100 year uh, video that was shared. And one of the uh, speakers that was interviewed said way, way back um, when film cameras were just being built, it was um, one of, <laughs> it's the, uh, this might be a good time to put your phones on silent. Because <laughs> I'm the first of four or five presenters, so. Um, but anyway, he was talking about, you know, the, the original cameras that came out, the black and white, or the film cameras that came out, um, they, half a dozen cameras would be uh, going out shooting, and then they'd take them to uh, the little um, uh, cinemas. And if all of the sprockets and the format didn't match up, then you'd have uh, a bit of a hassle in trying to uh, stream and put it on a projector. So standards are very, very important. Uh, there's two that SMPTE are, are well known. Uh, everybody knows about color bars, SMPTE color bars and SMPTE time code. I think time code's still being used. Yes? Everybody knows about time code? Drop frame, no, non-drop? Um, and so far, some of the committees that, uh, to give you an idea of what, what is going on, they have a D-Cinema committee, you know, so uh, 
again, the presentation in the theaters is, uh, is the same. Um, cinema sound, file formats, and the list goes on. There's, there's quite a few. Uh, and in fact, Alan used to be chair or vice president? Vice president. Vice president standards. So if you want to know anything about standards, one, two, third row, first person in. Um, some of the standards that you might be, Rick might have talked about this in his class, IMF, MF, MXF, okay, maybe next year. <laughs> so here comes the part, why well, SEMPTI? So, so I've got five things listed here. One is people, and the people part comes in as uh, SEMPTI is a global organization. And um, everybody in this room that are not students, uh, students can come to us and say, hey, you know what, I got an idea. I want to do something. How can I advance? And uh, can you introduce me to somebody? We're all open. We're all ears. We're here to help you. So uh, people is a very, very important on the networking side. So uh, do keep that in mind. Uh, enhance your career because, again, through the whole uh, uh, educational side, there's, a, if you visit the website, there are tools, knowledge, uh, papers, videos that, uh, that you can um, view and help advance uh, your knowledge base. Um, we do record most of our meetings. We do have a, uh, which I'll show at the end of my slides, we do have a YouTube channel. So uh, if you find yourself uh, under the weather and have nothing to watch because Netflix is uh, not what you want to watch, tune into our YouTube channel and wow, our numbers will go up. <laughs> uh, recognition, SEMPTI is a recognized uh, um, entity. Um, the value in membership, and, and we hope that uh, you guys get involved and, and volunteer some of your hours. Uh, come and have a uh, sit down with us during our board meetings. We'd love to get your input on, on what it is that uh, you need from us or, or things like that. Uh, yeah, like it says here, simply having simply participation on your resume will likely open doors. And knowledge, again, it's uh, the simply journals, the videos uh, are definitely things that can help you. And then I've got one thing at the very end, the local uh, uh, section assistance. One of the things that uh, we want to do, uh, Montreal is already doing it and they're having good success. We want to start a bursary program and we're not sure whether we're going to have two or three. Uh, it will likely be uh, in the September fall time time frame. Um, you need to be a member, but we're going to reach out to students and say, hey, you know, why should we pick you to support? And we don't know what the uh, value or numeration is yet, but uh, so we want to get involved with, with you guys to say, hey, you know what, we're going to move on and we need uh, people to, uh, to fill in the gaps when we uh, go into uh, full-time retirement. So there's the place to join. Uh, you can go to uh, a SEMPTI website and it'll uh, take you uh, there as well. And, and my point here is this can be yours, use it. It's, um, it reminds me of um, we do profusion every year. We have a booth, and Rick is so kind to um, give us a uh, loan of students to help man the booth. And uh, not last year, but the year before, I forget the lady that I had with me. She was passionate, third year, I think, or fourth year. She was passionate about doing movies, telling stories about the disabled. And then I said, well, you need to go talk to these people. So I sent her over to uh, WIF, which is Wil uh, uh, Women in Film and Television, and another place, and she came back, and I guarantee you she was walking three feet up in the air. And I'm going like, okay, what just happened? She says, I made some contacts, they want to see my reel, yada, yada, and so there was a door that was open. Now, I'm not sure what happened, 
because I didn't follow up with her. But uh, again, there's there's a uh, uh, just a contact, a uh, potential of saying, hey, maybe you should try this. And then, and if there's one word, like uh, Picard would say, engage. Just come around and um, and uh, we'll help you as, as best we can. So this, this is the Contact Us page. So you can see that uh, YouTube, all you got to do is uh, search Simpty Toronto. Uh, we Twitter, we Facebook. Uh, that's our email address and LinkedIn and uh, our website. And I do have to give thanks to Patrick Griffins. Griffiths. Um, he uh, sent me his slide deck because he did one of these in San Francisco. And I, I borrowed some of his slides with some of the information he had. So I give thanks to, uh, to Patrick. And that's my, I don't even know what. Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, so IP or Internet Protocol is, uh, thank you, Tony, is uh, sort of something we've been talking about, I know, in my classes, and I'm sure all the students around here have, been, have heard, heard the acronym IP uh, as it, for broadcast. So uh, we thought we'd bring in an expert to talk to you a little bit about that. No, I'm not an expert. <laughs> so <laughs> Ryan Morris, uh, system engineer working with Arista Networks. His focus is media and entertainment uh, vertical. While at Arista, Morris has assisted with the successful design and configuration of numerous ST2110, and you'll hear that 2110 a lot tonight probably, deployments across the globe, while also acting as an SME and performing numerous training courses and discussions regarding the broadcast industry's transition to IP. So please uh, help me in welcoming Ryan Morris. Thank you. Forward, backward, and laser. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, so yeah, my name is Ryan Morris. I'm a systems engineer at Arista Networks, and I focus on generally SIMD 2110 deployments. So uh, we'll, I'll generally just be speaking with you guys today about um, generally multicast, a way of whoops, um, a way of transporting video, audio, metadata over IP from source to multiple uh, destinations. So just so I can gauge the crowd, does anybody find this in any way funny, humorous, or anything? That's good. I like that. I like that. I like that. Um, for those who don't find this funny yet, learn more about networking, and I promise you this will be better than Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, all those guys. This will laugh you to sleep. All right? So IP really is the enabler right now in the media and entertainment industry. From post-production, edits, renders, to you know, live broadcasting, it's, it's everywhere right now. From play out, master control, everything. You go to some of the installations here in Toronto, some of them have already converted their master controls into uh, SMPTE 2110. And just a raise of hand, who here has used, I guess, video over IP before? Is anyone? Everybody should raise their hands. I assume everybody here watches Netflix or YouTube. <coughs> Every single person here should be raising their hands. But, the net, but Netflix and YouTube is a bit different from traditional broadcasting. And we'll get into the, differ like the differences why. Predominantly, it's because it's called unicast, which means one-to-one, -one, whereas live video and master control play out, that's called multicast. But we'll, again, we'll be getting into that shortly. So here's just one reason why some people are migrating into uh, SMPTE 2110 or converting from video to IP. So how many signals are there generally on a single coaxial cable? Generally, it's one signal with all your audio, your metadata, all those. And it's unidirectional. That's pretty inefficient. Um, migrating into IP, you can fit many signals on one cable. So we're here on the far right looking at 100 gigs per second. So if we look at how many HD signals we can get on there, so one and a half gigabits per second, we can get, say, maybe 80 or 65, and then we go down to UHD, we have even more. Or sorry, we have less, but we have a lot of them all together in a 100 gigabit per second cable. Um, and it's also, obviously, it's, it's full duplex, so it's not unidirectional. So 
35 in one direction and also 35 the other. That doesn't include all your audio channels. Audio people like to be able to manipulate different audio channels. There can be thousands of them on one cable. It's really cool. And now we're even getting bigger than 100 gigs. There are deployments out there right now, or, and will be more in the future, that are using 400 gigabit per second. And we're already thinking about connectivity of 800 gigabits per second. That's a lot of video on one cable. So we have to understand protocols, and really what we're going to be focusing on, but I do go into it a bit, is uh, unicast, but really what we'll be focusing on is, is multicast and some of its friends here. So broadcast is one to everybody, essentially, in your VLAN, in your subnet. So I'm just going to be yelling out to every single person in this room, and whether you like it or not, you're hearing what I'm saying. That's broadcast. From a unicast perspective, that's just one-to-one. -one. Okay, so that's like, I don't know, uh, um, a direct message on Twitter, something like that. You're sending one message from you to somebody else, and that's it. Multicast, it can be one-to-one, -one, but it can also be one-to-many. So again, using a Twitter example, when you subscribe to, I don't know, Kim Kardashian's Twitter feed, and then she updates with what she ate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you all get it whether you like it or not. That's multicast. You subscribe to it, and you get it. What, and she, she's the source, and you're the destination. That is multicast. So why is multicast a really, really good fit from a broadcasting perspective? The reason for that is because how often do you ever send anything from just one source to one destination? It's probably pretty rare. You're going to send something from a source to maybe some type of frame sync, some type of, some type of switcher, a multi-viewer. So in order to send it from one source to multiple destinations, in the IP, in IP networks, you have to take advantage of multicast. So that's why it's taken really advantage of in all of these deployments. And it's, it's not common, really, multicast. It's really the broadcasting industry that uses this predominantly. Financial trading, financial markets, they use it as well. But we use it all the time in broadcast. We have to use it. So if you talk to a lot of IT folks at a lot of these you know, broadcasting stations, they won't want to touch multicast. They're scared of it. They shouldn't be, but they are because they're unfamiliar with it. But us broadcast engineers, we have to know it. It is absolutely vital in our careers to know about this, this protocol. Okay. So here's just a, just a bit of a description of the different messages in multicast. Um, I'll start with the host devices there at the bottom. So when you have a broadcast controller, so when you're pushing a button on a panel, let's say you want to route camera one to multi-viewer one, that multi-viewer will send out what's called an IGMP join for a multicast address that's associated with, say, camera one. So the, so the multi-viewer will send a join out for this signal. It'll hit the network, and through all the networking voodoo, it'll get the signal from the source to the destination. That's called a join. Then there's also every 120 seconds or so, the router will send out an update to everybody in its subnet, everybody in its network, every two minutes or so, saying, what do you want? What signal do you want? What signal do you want? What signal do you want? Constantly updating, constantly asking for updates. And if a receiver doesn't end up responding to that, it'll actually, the network will actually drop the signal. So it's very important that a receiver or multi-viewer, whatever the device is, responds to this, what's called a general query. But you don't always want to be receiving a multicast signal forever. That's, that's, that would be horrible because you would saturate your bandwidth extremely easily. Right now we're doing things in UHD, so 4K. And from a SIPD 2110 perspective, that bandwidth is 10 gigabits per second. So if you weren't able to, to leave that group, um, you would always be getting that signal to your end device. That's horrible. It's very, very bad. So that's why in IGMP, there's something called an IGMP leave message as well. So when you transition, possibly, on, your, on a receiver from one multicast group to another multicast group, you first might send an IGMP leave saying, I don't want this. Get out of here. I don't want to look at camera one anymore. Then you say, I want to look at camera two. So the IGMP leave will be followed by an IGMP join message. Those are just some of the 
messages that go on in, uh, in multicast. They will be very, very, very important to understand as you embark on your multicast journey. Okay. So multicast, like cameras, you know, if you have a camera or any type of gateway that is outputting multicast, it just fires it out. It just fires it out from the device to the network, and that's it. That's all it does. Then it's up to all of your receivers to request it. The source has absolutely no knowledge of who's actually requesting it in multicast. This is different from unicast. In unicast, you have to say who, are, who you are sending it to. So it's you making a phone call to somebody, and you're dialing that number. That is unicast. But in multicast, we just, again, fire it off, and we are waiting for all the destinations, all of the receivers, or whoever wants it, whoever wants to listen to it, to request it in some fashion. And again, multicast destinations are able to, sus to subscribe to what they want and leave what they what leave with the group whenever they want. That's part of the standard. And then, if using this example here, if the switcher on the right is requesting this camera feed, it'll go through the network. So it'll go from the switch on the left to the switch at the very, very top, down to the one on the bottom right, and out to the uh, down to the switcher. So it sends an IGMP request, IGMP join, and then the signal propagates through the network accordingly. But then you have a multi-viewer. Someone wants to actually monitor what's going into that switcher. It seems very reasonable. So the multi-viewer then will send out another IGMP join. So we don't replicate, we replicate the signal, but we don't double the bandwidth. So it's not like two ca the camera signal is, you know, if it's outputting 10 gigabits per second, it's not like it's outputting 10 gigabits per second to go to the switcher, and then 10 gigabits per second to go to the multi-viewer it gets replicated at the nearest point to the receivers. So in this case here, the switcher is getting it off of switch, the bottom right. The multiviewer is getting it off the bottom middle one, but it's getting, the signal is getting replicated out both interfaces on the top switch. This is again pretty efficient. Oh, this is a pretty efficient way of managing bandwidth. You only replicate it whenever you need to on whichever switch needs to replicate it. So you're not gonna be doubling, tripling, quadrupling your bandwidth in any way using multicast. Okay. So yeah, IGMP is extremely useful. But there are some things that is not. It is not a perfect protocol by any stretch. It does not, these pro multicast protocols do not know how, pop, how saturated the link is. It's not bandwidth aware. And that's always going to be important to know, especially as we go into, move into 2110 streams where the stream bandwidth might be 10 gigabits per second, or even in the future, 40 gigabits per second. They, the, these protocols are not bandwidth aware, which means that um, if a link only has one gigabit per second left on there from bandwidth perspective, bandwidth perspective if it's 99% full, and you try to request a stream that's, say, 10 gigabits per second, you can oversubscribe that link and kill every single video on that cable. So you have to be very careful with this. Also, it's not bandwidth aware of the source either. So we will, PIM, IGMP, IGMP and all other multicast protocols will treat, the, will treat the multicast stream the same whether or not it's a one and a half megabit per second audio stream that has one channel or a 10 gigabit per second video stream. It doesn't care. They have, you know, there's some algorithm to calculate which links it'll, it'll take it'll, to traverse the network but from you know, any reasonable person's perspective, it's relatively random. So they will be treated the same. And that's also important to know. So again, there is a possibility that you can oversubscribe your links, oversaturate your links, and then take down every other video in your network on that link. So if not IGMP, then what do you use? Well, you'll probably hear this thrown out a lot, SDN, or Software Defined Networking. There are tools. Um, broadcast controllers that instead of just telling a device what to look for, what multicast group to look for, it actually looks at all of the bandwidth available on the switch on every single link and also knows the bandwidth of every single stream that's going through your network as well. So you, it'll know that if this link is totally full, don't use that link, don't even try to use that link, 
use a different link that's less full. These are becoming more increasingly common in SMPTE 2110 deployments, specifically because of these enormous bit rates. We didn't need to use that, you know, when everything was, you know, MPEG-4, you know, 8, gig, 8 megabits per second, or 10 megabits per second, 30 megabits per second. We didn't need that type of stuff. But now we really do. And it's becoming more and more common. So the way I like to think of it is, I, you know, IGMP is like, I know how to get back home. I'm going to take the DVP because I know I can take the DVP back home. But I'm pro I might run into traffic. I might, you know, there might be an accident there, and I might just never get home because I'll be stuck on the parkway. But SDN is going to be like me looking at Google Maps, and it'll tell me what path to take at any given point. It will know which, which roads are green, which roads are red, and then direct me accordingly. So think of an SDN like Google Maps, and think of IGMP as just your best effort to get home through a path that you happen to know. Okay? So it can be difficult, multicast. It really can be. But it takes practice, 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 practice. And not just reading the books of it, but also somehow getting labs, finding people who know about this, learning from their experiences. Nobody knows at all about multicast. I certainly know very little about it, but I try very hard. Not many industries use multicast, but broadcasting really does. So this is a really good opportunity for us as broadcast, you know, broadcast engineers, possibly, to really get a leg up on the, in, the networking, in the networking industry. Um, People, network engineers and broadcast engineers are needing to work together more and more to troubleshoot, you know, to troubleshoot these types of issues. And we really need to know this because there really are so many multicast streams going on in your network. I'm working on, a, you know, I'll, I'll work on a, an OB truck, um, outside, an outside broadcasting truck. So it's you know, not an enormous system by any stretch, but it's got maybe 60,000 multicast groups in there. Because you know they have different, you know, every single mono audio stream is its own multicast stream. That's a lot of multicasting. You really have to know multicast in order to build the system correctly and how to operate the system correctly. But there is good news with all this. As more and more of these systems are becoming you know, mainstream, as more and more people are starting to deploy this, there's just the expertise is becoming more common from a broadcasting perspective. People are learning faults of others that have, that have done it, you know, the, the first people who were ultimately incredibly brave and adopted these new standards and are learning from those mistakes, if there were any. You know, as an example, is anyone here familiar with something called uh, time to live from an IP perspective? So, uh, so that means essentially that once your packet hits a router, a value called time to live decrements. Once it hits zero, the packet goes away packet disappears and it's gone. Audio guys love to be different. Audio is always different. It's always the hardest thing in the world. I don't know why, but it is. A lot of audio devices have a TTL default of one. That is absolutely horrible in a lot of these deployments now because that means once the packet hits your router, all of your audio goes away. And people generally like to have audio. So even if you're armed with all the literature, you keep practicing, you know, you'll end up like Captain Picard over there, which is nice considering you said engage. That's really good too. Um, and you'll just face palm sometimes because you'll just be at your wit's end. And it's just, it, it just takes practice. I run into these things all the time too. And you'll always hear people say, it's the network. It's the network. It's the network. Sometimes it is. A lot of times though it isn't. And seriously, there's nothing more gratifying than finding out that it's actually not the network. It might be an endpoint device like something that's audio related that has a TTL of one or someone who misconfigures an IP address. There are lots of different ways that things can go wrong as we're going into these systems, but it's our job to really learn those and become more efficient. So there are lots of ways of doing this, taking advantage of different protocols like DHCP where IP addresses get assigned automatically or taking, taking advantage of these SDNs. So although there are challenges now, um, I'm very confident that as these become more common uh, and everyone gets significantly more expertise, it'll, it'll become templates eventually and we'll all, be, uh, we'll all be happier in a broadcast environment that's all IP. And thank you.
Okay, so uh, thank you again, Glenn. Uh, uh, Ryan, sorry. Uh, next, coming up, uh, we have Peter Armstrong. Peter Armstrong uh, is, uh, has been working in the television and film industry for 40 years. He has experience in both production and post-production operational areas, with the majority of his time in post-production. Peter oversees THP's production centers in Toronto, London, the UK, and New York. Peter is a longtime SIMPTI member and has served, uh, served on the Toronto section SIMPTI board for 12 years of the last 17 years. And I'm proud to have been working with Peter. Thanks so much, Thank Peter. <laughs> and Peter is going to talk today about color theory in television. Yes. Thank you for having me. Um, so, I'm going to talk about color, tele, color, color theory in television, but it's going to be pretty basic and simple. Uh, the National Television System Committee was set up in the United States in 1941, and they set the standard for black and white television in the United States. Uh, there were no pre provisions for color with the first incarnation of the NTSC system. Color television began commercially in the United States in December 1953. Color television didn't come to Canada until September 1966, and our color comes with a U. It was launched in southern Ontario and then expanded to other Canadian markets over the next two to four years. The color system adopted in North America, Japan, and these other countries in green. Uh, this was the NTSC, the second NTSC standard. The National Television System Committee began exploring the possibility of the color television system in around 1950 and selected the system we now know as NTSC in 1954. This color system remained in place until the transition to high definition television with a new color standard there, which began in 1998. Uh, in Germany and the UK and most of Europe, they improved upon the NTSC color system and they adopted what was called phase alternating line or PAL. It was actually developed in Germany, and uh, I believe it was the, uh, the UK that started first with it, broadcasting. Uh, the French adopted or developed a similar color system called CCAM. Uh, they could have used PAL, I guess, but having just had their fun with the Germans back in the 40s, they weren't really that interested in having any more German uh, put upon them, so they went with their own system. So, like I said, the BBC began color broadcasting in 1967, and uh, France followed soon after that with their CCAM system. So, as I said, both systems were developed from the NTSC, and they took the extra time to improve upon what NTSC uh, was. And for our, all the old uh, guard in here would know that sometimes the NTSC was referred to as never the same color. So, it had a lot of problems. So, I don't want any of the SIMPTI members who know this, but does any student here know why we have 2398, 2997 frame rates? Do you? Do any of you know? So, the reason we have this strange decimal point frame rate is that when the NTSC color was adopted in North America, backward compatibility with the existing black and white system was made possible by overlaying a subcarrier with color information into the black and white signal. The original black and white system in North America worked at 30 frames a second. And this was due to our 60 hertz frequency of AC power. Uh, the same reason is why in the UK or in Europe, they have 25 frame rate uh, signal is because it worked with a half rate of 50 hertz of their power over there. So when the NTSC color subcarrier was added to the black and white signal, it created static noise on the image in the black and white televisions. So the solution to the problem was to by shifting the frame rate from 30 to 2997. This got rid of the static on the existing black and white televisions and they reprodu reproduced the 2997 frame rate quite well and the new color televisions could reproduce their color signal. Now, this is called the CIE 1931 chart or, or image and this was created by the International Commission on Illumination in 1931. And it was developed to give a reasonable representation of the visible color space that can be seen by the average human color vision. 
The numbers around the outside represent the wavelengths in nanometers of the various colors. The ultraviolet and the blue are in the low to mid 400 nanometer range. Green is in the 500, as you can see at the top there. And then the orange, yellow, and red are 500 to 700 nanometers. Now, do you know what a nanometer is? How long that is? A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So that frequency response is pretty high. <coughs> so even though our eyes can see all the various wavelengths, the colors, the capture devices, cameras, and display devices, televisions, and monitors uh, that, are in the entire, that are in the NTSC ecosystem, they cannot match the ability of our human vision system. So I've superimposed on here, I've stolen this from somebody. Uh, this is a superimposition on this chart showing the NTSC system and what it's capable of capturing and transmitting and potentially reproducing. And this was before the development of HD TV, because most of you who are in school now probably never even experienced SD television, NTSC. These systems, these NTSC systems were analog, and even when they were, uh, we moved into the digital processing in the 1980s, the color space remained the same. So you can see there's a lot of colors there outside of that triangle that television, standard definition television, could, could not produce very well. Oranges, browns, some of the purples, very difficult for them, for us to see them on a TV. So, As I mentioned two slides earlier, a lot of color limitations were with the capture and the display. The camera technology was in its infancy, and this slide shows the NTSC color space in the yellow triangle, and the smaller triangles represent some of the cathode ray CRT monitors and their capability of reproducing colors. So as you can see, there were some, quite a few limitations with the technology in producing all the colors that we can see. So in the early 1990s, the HD revolution takes shape and committees and think tanks start working on new standards for high definition video. And they determined with the technology at that time that this is the color space that we are capable of capturing and displaying. The International Telecommunication Union, the ITU, which is the international body that was regulating this aspect of our industry, they called this color space recommendation BT.709. It was often called ITU 709 or BT.709, or we pretty much always just dumbed it down to Rec 709 for Recommendation 709. As you can see there, there are less colors than in the, in the NTSC color space, but with the higher resolution uh, that we have with HD, the, the slight loss in color didn't matter. The reproduction still looked great. All our current HD cameras, editing systems, display technology, HD projectors, HD monitors, all work in this Rec. 709 color space. So what about digital cinema? What color space is used there? A working group called the Digital Cinema Initiative, or the DCI, set the digital cinema color space known as DCI P3. So it was developed in the early 2000s and adopted this color space for the current generation of digital cinema projectors, or I guess, let's say the generation back in, from 2000 to 2018. As you can see, it is capable of encompassing more than any of the previous color systems. And to future-proof digital cinema mastering, the DCI group set a mastering and archival color space called XYZ color. This space encompassed all of the visible spectrum and it can retain all the data captured by current and future cameras and retain that information should we develop display technology that can match the human vision. You'll notice that the green area in this slide represents color space of traditional 35 millimeter film. And you'll see that the film actually has a wider color array that it can capture or it can see or it can display to us than the P3 digital cinema projectors. Uh, economics and many other superior factors of digital cinema was the demise of the traditional film about six to seven years ago. Our imaging and display technology keeps advancing and Ultra HD, 4K, and even 8K have become easily achievable. 
On the consumer display front, 4K has almost eliminated HD displays. With this technology advancement comes a bigger color space, which under the ITU is called recommendation, recommendation BT.2020, or as we call it, Rec2020. So here are the three most common color spaces in use today. And as you can see, the new Rec2020 color space will provide the largest color space of all the standards. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, okay, enough about the history lessons. What about some of the new stuff like high dynamic range, HDR? HDR isn't so much about color space as it is about the greater contrast and brightness and the availability to better capture and reproduce the images we want the, the viewer to enjoy. HDR utilizes the wide color space of Rec 2020. It has the rich blacks and the ability to see details in the shadows. And it has much brighter, a much brighter picture. And you can see spec specular highlights and more details in the brightest points of the image. Our human vision has very high dynamic range. We can see in low light and in very bright conditions. Standard dynamic range video have always taken the contrast and the color from real life and compressed it down into a narrow bandwidth of 0.05 to 300 candelas per squared meter. And that's the top, let's see, we got a thing here. This, this here, you can see how it really takes that wide bandwidth and narrows it down to that. This unit of CD M2 is also referred to as a NIT. Your typical SD monitor will have anywhere from 100 to 300 NITs in brightness, depending on how it's set up. An HD display will have a much brighter range from 0 0.0005 NITs in the blacks to eventually 10,000 NITs for the brightest highlights. Now, I'll give you a little bit of an idea of what nits mean. A sunny day, if you were to go outside and measure brightness in a sunny day, it's 7,000 to 10,000 nits. So I kind of wonder about these 10,000 nit televisions they're talking about. I think you're going to have to wear sunglasses to actually watch the TV. Uh, an overcast day is around 3,000 to 7,000 nits. And if you were to look directly at the sun, which would be pretty uncomfortable, the sun is over a billion nits if you're staring right at it. In HDR production, the higher dynamic range is first captured by an HDR-capable camera. These cameras capture very wide exposures, and they, have, uh, they would capture in a logarithmic fashion. This per permits a much greater amount of image information capture over a linear type device, linear camera. And most of the high-end digital camera, cinema cameras do this quite nicely. During the post-production phase, the HDR information is maintained through the edit and color grading, on, and they would obviously grade on a HDR mastering monitor. There are several competing versions of HDR being developed by various manufacturers. HDR10 is one of the sy systems supported by Sony, LG, and Samsung, and Vizio. HDR10 will support monitor brightness of 1,000 nits. Uh, so that's quite a bit brighter than your 300 nit monitor. Dolby Vision is another HDR format, and as the name implies, was developed by the Dolby Labs group. Their monitors can currently go to 4,000 nits, and I've seen one of those monitors, and they are pretty bright. And they are working towards a 10,000 nit brightness. Advancements in capture and display technology has allowed HDR to become a reality. OLED organic light emitting diode and QLED quantum dot light emitting diode monitors are making this possible. In the words of a renowned color scientist I know, Joachim Zell from eFilm, he once said to me, this OLED monitor, it's better than looking at real life. Thanks. That's an OLED screen that's curved and super thin. Thank you, Peter. So Peter gave us sort of an overview of, of color and how it's used in television. And uh, 
So now how do we sort of achieve that properly in, in our digital cinema system and in what we're trying to shoot as cinematographers? So next guest that we have is, oh, lights down? Okay, I'll bring them down. Um, next guest is David Corley, president of DSC Laboratories. David uh, was educated in the UK at Christ Church Cathedral School, Oxford, and at King's in Canterbury. David came to Canada as a young man, he still is a young man, where he worked in film and television production, and, his, and with his wife Sue, established DSC Laboratories in 1962. Always concerned with image quality, David involved himself in the design of test materials to enable consistency and technical uh, accuracy of images in production through display, which work continues to this day in conjunction with advances in equipment and technology. Having worked in SIMT and IEEE engineering committees, David is the only Canadian to be honored with the Fuji Gold Medal in 1994, and in 2011 received a special Gemini Award for Outstanding Technical Achievement in Canada. Other awards and recognitions include the Canada Award for Business Excellence in 1987, the New Bay Award for uh, Product Innovation in 2016, his most recent award in uh, 1917, that's wrong. <coughs> 1917. I didn't get this, I got this from Tony. Uh, <laughs> in 2017 was the Simti Camera uh, Origination and Imaging Medal. In addition to Life Fellow status with Simti, David was uh, elected Canadian Governor of Simti and served as Director of Education. Thank you for being with us today, David. No, you can turn the, no, whatever you like. How do we make this thing go oh, forwards yes. and backwards? Sorry? This thing? That's forward, backwards, and laser pointer. Oh, oh, it's cool, very clever. Okay, well, this all sounds very wonderful. You'd think I was a brilliant. I'm afraid it's not true. I mean, yes, I went to school. I went to Christchurch, Oxford, and I left there when I was uh, 13 because I had a glandular fever, and that was pretty well the end of my education. So while I admire knowledge, uh, education doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it. I had to get it the hard way. And uh, this, this is something that has, I found actually very beneficial because I was so stupid that I asked questions and people said, well, that can't be done. We, they had a very low dynamic range, and NASA wanted a greater dynamic range in, the, in their cameras. So I said, well, you can't do it with a matte surface film. You've got to use gloss. And so we proposed a high gloss surface test chart, which gave two to three uh, f-stops greater dynamic range. I remember one fellow came to our booth, and he said, this is absolutely ludicrous. It's, nobody's going to go for that. Well, within a year, 95% of our charts were all high gloss because you could very easily get rid of any reflection by dropping a black flag. So any reflection uh, directly from behind the camera was trapped in this black flag. So you've got this beautiful wide dynamic range. Well, this is one, this is a typical example. So. That is in there just to show when Sue and I started the company, our kids were, I think our youngest was six weeks old or something like that. And I had no experience in television. I was making, I was making um, commercials and movies and this, this sort of thing. So, and I had a wonderful experience. I became associate producer of a show called QED. It was on CTV Network, and we did 20, 22 episodes, 22 half-hour episodes. And I, had, I was a very, very fortunate fellow because I, had to, I, took, I, I, I was charged with taking the pictures of all the famous people. So we met Ava Gabor, Eleanor Roosevelt, Aldous Huxley. But they had most fun with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. Joanne Woodward was eight months pregnant at the time, and she wanted to 
orange juice. She felt like orange juice. So Sue got some oranges and squeezed the fresh orange juice. The bottom line was, when we took them back to the airport, and I gave Paul the checks for uh, appearing on the show, he said, we've had so much fun, I cannot take the money, give it to a university or something. So that we did later on. So then we went back into making our black and white television commercials. Color came along and we made this test chart to keep the film labs honest. We would shoot that with the slate so that we had a good reference and we could tell the, the labs what we needed, whether we wanted the picture more light or less light or so on. We also made the little thing there to uh, uh, put, it, put it on an electronic slate. So because our pictures were not reproducing, I thought, well, at all, I went to the CBC and I said, this is, there's something wrong, you're doing something wrong. And so they said, well, you better come down. And we took the slate and they, we ran their existing test slide. They were using a silver image, neutral gray test, ch test target to line up the cameras. Well, it looked great for black and white, but for color film, they all came out looking like that. And I said, well, this is wrong. So we, I got there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I didn't leave until oh, 11 o'clock or so, at the time when the, in those days, the national anthem was God Save the Queen. Many of you would, are not old enough to know that. It was before, before we had O Canada, and they were playing God Save the Queen when I went, went home. And uh, so the next day I tried to look at the problem and said, well, what is there in the real world? Why, how can this be happening? And why, why hasn't somebody figured it out? And I looked at different things, and the first thing I thought, I thought, why is the sky blue? Does anybody know why the sky is blue? It's r ridiculous. The sun is not blue. The sun is not shining blue light at it. But then why does the sky go red at night? Different people looked into this. John Tyndall, Lord Raleigh Einstein and Callier, he came up with the clearest answer in the, in the 20s and 30s. What was happening is with all the dust and microscopic particles in the atmosphere was scattering more of the blue wavelengths, the blue short wavelengths, which was showing us off as a blue sky, while the red and the green, the long wavelengths, came on through. So I figure this is what is happening with the television. This is exactly the same thing. They're using a piece of silver image film, which is minute, tiny specks of, of uh, silver. Works fine for black and white. But what is happening is it's scattering the blue light and restricting it, letting through the red and the green. So I um, discussed this with chief engineer Stan Quinn uh, in Montreal and uh, he nominated me for Simpty. In those days, you had to be nominated. And uh, I would never have got in otherwise. I mean, uh, you know, a kid who had absolutely no credentials whatsoever to be nominated for Simpty. So anyhow, he did it and they uh, accepted me as a member. And over the next, what, year, year and a half, we developed a test slide that would work for color film. And it was really very obvious. And I don't know why nobody thought of it. We patented the idea, which is to make a grayscale slide out of color film. I mean, it's so logical and common sense, but nobody had thought of it. So we did that, and these became, we tested it on the CBC, and uh, they were tickled to bits about it, with it because we found the problem and the solution. So we then started selling these, well, we wrote, wrote up a paper. Uh, Stan Quinn, Dan McRae, and I was the third. We, did, we each did our own particular bit of expertise, which was, we gave the paper in Washington, D.C., and uh, 
I, all right, Sue, I won't tell them what Stan did. Stan told a dirty joke, which uh, brought the house down. But anyway, this, uh, so that was published the following year in the journal. And this, as the previous, as Peter was saying, we looked at the standards. They were, they were all over the place. We were shooting to NTSC, supposedly, but this, the TV set manufacturers couldn't make NTSC. If they did, you had to look at the TV in the darkened room. So they then came up with their own standard. We measured these, which um, we called typical modern phosphors. And uh, these will show you the different uh, standards. Anyhow, SMPT, in its bless its heart, its wisdom, uh, came up with Simpty C, which was the standard for the Conrack monitor, which was used at all the TV stations. So really, what was happening in the real world was that the TV stations were making wonderful pictures for the Conrack monitor. <coughs> Pardon me, but the people at home were viewing them on an entirely different piece of equipment. So um, the, the smart users actually, what, ha what, what happened, we had to make two test slides, one for EBU, because EBU had, did the same research that CBC and I did in Canada, and they came up with what they called the EBU standard. And so, um, but it never caught on in North America. I went to the... Uh, uh, SPTC, anyhow, the, 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 the board here, and they liked the idea, but because SIMPTI was the standard in North America, we, we went with it. Luckily, in 2009, 709 came along, and we standard, not 2009? Okay. Do you remember what year it was, anyhow? Well, back then, yes, no, it, it, was, it was 2090, I think, something like. Anyhow, whenever. So we said, okay, we've solved the problem for film. Now we've got to solve the problem for front lip, for, for cameras. How are they lining up cameras? Well, the standard way was just to take a sheet of white paper and white balance to that. Well, white paper, as I'm sure you all know, can be many, many different shades and brightnesses and colors of white. So we came up with a thing which was a true white. We called it cam white. This led on to many other different test patterns which um, all had, we made very precise colors which produced a hexagon on a uh, vec vector scope which made it very easy to see when your cameras were accurately lined up. This was a great success, and we started selling charts all over the world. And uh, this was I kind of like. I think it, that's in Buckingham Palace, where they were setting up Sky TV in England, were setting up to shoot uh, the Queen. And uh, NASA used them. <coughs> and for all uh, the pictures from space, selecting cameras and so on. So this was all a Canadian invention. You can be very proud of the country for it. So um, they were also used in deep sea research and uh, still are. And then we made test patterns for our beloved society, the, the CAM book, and I was speaking with Barbara the, uh, about making a new test pattern of SIMPTI because this is old technology. A couple of years ago, we came up with a different... Oh, there's a smaller SIMPTI chart. We came up with this pattern, which some of you may have seen and even used. The object is you shoot that the radiating pattern makes it very easy to match. Because when you put it into post and you look at it on a monitor, you, you put the digital file over it. Well, we know the digital file B to, by default is accurate. So you center the digital file over the pattern, 
and then you color correct your scene to match the digital file. As soon as you've done that, then you know that your scene is accurate because the digital file is accurate. There is one caveat, and that is the monitor. They could both, both the digital file and your scene could be too red, too blue, too anything. But this didn't correct the monitors. Now, there are electronic systems for lining up monitors. We didn't altogether trust them, so we developed a thing we call screen align which is a self-illuminated unit that you can set to different color temperatures and brightnesses. This, we liked it because we call it WYSIWYG. Have you heard that term? Yes, what you see is what you get. Well, this is the, the way it works. You, you, you put it in front of your monitor and you align, you set the color temperature you want and you align your monitor to it. So it's, it's not rocket science. This it can be hung from monitors. It can be used even with 100-foot displays. You can, you can set it up. So this led to a number of different charts, and this is a little Rolly chart. This was the big Rolly chart. They used 12 of these for the um, international soccer games from Russia, I don't know. Uh, uh, they, they, they used to call it the Canadian chart, which, uh, so then this was also being used by the network C CBS Sports for, oh, their PGA and the tennis championships and the, so on. They're, they're lining up cameras with it. So this is um, the latest thing is this, which gives you on one side, you've got uh, NT, no, 709 colors, and the other side, you've got 20, 20, 20. So we also have a little mask then you can put over the chart and uh, just line up to one or the other without interfering. The, the other thing that this does that is totally unique, it lets you measure resolution. How do you measure camera or screen or resolution now? You've got to line up your camera on a chart and it's got to fit exactly. You, you can't frame it a little bit this way, a little bit that way. This, you, you just shoot the chart anywhere in the scene and then you superimpose a grid. Now the, the grid tells you you, you look at and see which of the circles in there, A, B, C, D, or E, is the sharpest. Then you go to this little table and you say, okay, if we've got, what is it, row, uh, we, we, we can see row A and it's covering three of the squares, then we've got that much resolution. If, if we can only see row B, then it's covering this much. So it makes it very, very simple and very quick to uh, measure resolution. And of course you can do it, you can then check the corner resolution of your chart, of, of, of your camera and the camera lens. You can check this lens against that lens and so on. Then now, the um, movie business and TV have quite honestly, they're so busy they don't have the time to spend that they used to spend on camera alignment and so on. The more important market to us now is law enforcement and the medical communities because their color accuracy and image accuracy can be a matter of life and death. So this is why we're now, oh, this was in one of the local supermarkets. So the security cameras, or it can be a passers-by camera, if they take it and, 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 and an event happens, then they've got that reference that however bad the camera is, we can make the picture very much better. So this will be invaluable for police. Uh, we've just got to get their heads around the idea, which once they do, then I think it'll go 
oh, this is in one of the local restaurants and this someplace else and so and so. Now, test chart accuracy, the only thing worse than not using a test chart is to use an inaccurate test chart because then you're automatically setting up to false information. So for this reason, we had came up with a new system which we provide a maintenance program. They also get a certificate saying that uh, they belong to the program. But this is only available. They cannot buy it. It's distributed by license, as which is more and more companies are doing that, Adobe and Microsoft and so on. So uh, that pretty well wraps up my little piece. And if you have any questions, I think they probably will talk about them later. But uh, thank, you thank you very much. And we... Okay, so uh, we've gone through color, we've gone through IP, all things that are really critical as cinematographers, as technical people. Something a lot of people have been talking about lately is AI, artificial intelligence. And oh, oh. Um, wrong one, Tony, sorry. Yeah, it's Gloria next. Gloria's next. Ah. But Louv is important too. <laughs> so um, we're very fortunate to have with us today Gloria Lee, VP Business Development at Gray Meta uh, Incorporated. Gloria is passionate about how technology can transform the media business, having worked at the cross-section of the two industries over, over 15 years. Uh, Gloria currently serves as VP Business Development at Gray Meta Incorporated, an intelligent uh, meta metadata solutions company powered by machine learning. Gloria is responsible for creating and executing strategies to meet Gray Meta's uh, revenue and customer growth targets for North America. Gloria was as well Senior Director of Business Development for Endeavor, Endeavor Streaming, an end-to-end -end online video services provider whose clients include the NBA, NFL, National Geographic, and Univision, and was Director of Global Digital for Miramax, providing strategic guidance and support to international digital and television sales teams in distributing the Miramax Film Library. Gloria currently serves as Founding President of Asian Americans, in media, AIM, and director at large for Women in Cable Telecommunications, New York chapter. Her other nonprofit leadership roles have included President Penn Club of Los Angeles and founding president, University of Pennsylvania Asian Alumni Network. Uh, thank you very much, Gloria, for making your way here today, and uh, please come on up. Thank you, Gloria. Forward, backward, and oh, yeah, I'm just probably Are you already? Okay. Yeah, but thank you. Um, thank you, Rick, for the introduction. Um, and thank you to the Ryerson students, um, students from the other colleges, and students of life who are here. So um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and talk with you about one of my favorite topics. And thanks again for the intro. Probably the most important thing is that I love new tech and how it can help uh, media companies grow. And I've done it at a, at a bunch of different places. So um, with that, I will begin the presentation. So, and and also to echo Peter's presentation, um, this is this is very kind of introductory. Um, I think new technology can be really confusing sometimes. Um, artificial intelligence is kind of this bright and shiny new object. So my goal today is to kind of uh, make it really simple and easy to understand. So we start with an introduction um, of what the term means, and then we talk about how, how actually you're using it in, in your everyday life, whether you know it or not. Um, and, then we, and then we move to kind of application in the broadcast and streaming business. So that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. For those of you who are, who are AI experts already, I'm, I'm sorry, this might bore you a little bit. So, um, and we can, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards in, in kind of a more advanced format. But this is really to get those of you who are new to, new to the AI world just kind of on board with what, what do those two letters really mean. So that's what it's about. Um, and with that, maybe I, maybe I will use this, so hold on. So, 
Okay, so we begin with the definition of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is kind of a, the, the word artificial is because it kind of grow, is built off of natural intelligence. So natural intelligence is really intelligence from your brain. So it's human intelligence. Artificial intelligence is intelligence created by machines. So machines learning how to do things. So um, whether it's problem solving, planning, reasoning, or identifying patterns. So that's really, to use everyday language, that's what AI, AI is. And then from there, here are some everyday examples of how AI is being used in your life today. So how many people in the room today have used Google? Like, raise your hand. How, how many people today, you know, took an Uber or a Lyft? Or have watched Netflix? Um, or have done a mobile deposit of a check? Or, or flew. I, I flew from New York, actually, so a couple days ago, so I, I was flying. But um, So with, with Google, if you have Gmail, so there's a, a function where it's kind of predicting what you're gonna, what you're gonna write. So that's actually AI that's, that's being used. For Uber and Lyft, um, the technology that's being used to kind of figure out which, which car is being sent to you to be picked up, that's also AI technology kind of at play. Um, for Netflix, uh, when it serves up uh, what, what it thinks you should be watching next, that's also AI. Um, for the SMPTE folks, you know, how, how the content is being sent to you and being sent to you in an efficient format, uh, that's also AI technology at play. Uh, for mobile check deposits, the, the text that you're scribbling down, AI is taking that and converting your handwritten language to, 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 to type typewritten language so it can so the bank can process your mobile deposit and then for for anyone who's flown recently uh, AI technology is also used there so on a typical flight um, I think seven minutes is is actually flown by a human pilot but the rest of that is 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 tied to AI technology so um, that's a little bit kind of simplifying what it is um, and then we kind of move to a history of AI so AI while it's kind of the latest and greatest technology today in some ways, AI and ML, it's kind of this shiny new object in the tech space, um, it's been around for a very long time. So it, ex it started in the 50s, um, and actually it started on the, the, the notion of it, or the industry, started on a, on a college campus. So for those of you who are on campus, lots of interesting things can, can, can start on campus. So it started at Dartmouth in the summer of 1956. Um, and then a scientist by the name of John McCarthy is actually the person who coined the term artificial intelligence as we know it today. Um, and, then it, and then from there, it had kind of a period of golden years from in the 50s to the 70s. Um, computers were starting to be used to solve algebra problems and were starting to be used to speak English. And then from there, there, were, there was so much expectation around what it could do, but tied to that, sometimes when there's too much expectation, it, things don't meet those expectations. So it, it entered kind of a winter, so to speak. So um, things kind of slowed down for, for a bit. And then it went back into a boom in the 80s. Um, this is when there was a period of expert systems, programs that answered specific questions around a specific domain. Um, and this has kind of generated a lot of interest from the business community. And then from there, it kind of went into another kind of winter. Um, and this is tied to just classical boom and bust of, of, of economies. Um, and then uh, from the 1990s to 2000, uh, this is when you started AI being, you, this is when uh, AI was starting to be successfully used in the tech industry. So it's kind of a segue into, into where we are today. And then in 2011 to the present, this is when big data, as we know, as we know it today, kind of started to evolve. And, and big data means basically every transaction that you're doing online today, there's, there's data around that. So basically as the internet kind of started to grow and there was all this data around everything that you could do online, that's today called big data. So there's a lot of um, information out there that can be mined and analyzed and, and, a, and AI plays a huge role in that kind of with all the the preliminary information that we've shared. And, and it's also a good segue to the next slide because tied to the, the streaming and, and broadcast, um, streaming wars are also starting to happen. So content in the, the content world before was traditionally distributed, meaning that it was distributed uh, to Comcast and to, uh, to cable operators. But today, it's all via digital. So there's a lot, then there's a lot more kind of stuff, so to speak, that can be analyzed via AI. Um, and then we switch to the application of AI in broadcast and streaming. So um, 
you know, so far we've talked about what it is, uh, what's happening in the landscape, and I'm also happy to take questions afterwards. Um, usually when I'm talking, I, I stop right now to ask questions, and I'm holding myself back from doing that because I would love to kind of um, get your feedback or thoughts. But um, So the application from a broadcast and streaming perspective um, is automating repetitive tasks. So things that are really simple and easy to do, AI can do that, and it actually frees up people to do much more complicated things. So it actually enables people to do more complex tasks, the, the tasks that are really simple and straightforward, AI can kind of do that for you. Um, it, as part of that and con kind of tied to that, um, AI enables monetization opportunities. Um, and what that really means in simple terms is that it helps keep make companies make money. That's really what, what those monetization opportunities is about. Um, and then third, here's a more specific use case. Um, AI can automate real-time facial recognition. So it can capture people's faces, and, uh, and I'll have specific examples of this after. Um, and then it can also create marketing opportunities for, for companies. So those are the four uh, broad categories, and then we'll switch to the example. So here is a screenshot of AI kind of at work. So here on the upper left-hand corner is um, a, a picture from uh, Wonder Woman. So this is part of a, a movie, and then underneath are kind of pieces of information that are being mined from, from that piece of video content. So here, we're able to find out when was Wonder Woman spoken, when was Wonder Woman text on screen, um, and then when, when, when another kind of scenario for Wonder Woman. So, and I'm happy to talk more about this afterwards, because I know there's a lot of text on there and kind of stuff on there. Um, I just want to be mindful of the people who are coming after me, so. Um, but that's a little bit about automating repetitive tasks. So in, without AI technology, every time that Wonder Woman shows up in a, in a video, you have to kind of go and find that manually. So AI helps to kind of find things like, like that's a perfect example of kind of AI at work. Um, the monetization scenario, uh, there's a company called Video Fashion in New York that has 40 years of, of video content. So this story is a, a little bit sad, but um, when Kate Spade passed away, because of AI technology, they were able to go and quickly look through all of their 40 years of video content to figure out every time Kate Spade's name was spoken, every time Kate Spade's brand showed up on TV, every time there was Kate Spade, the words Kate Spade on screen, and as a result of that, they were able to make $135 per, per second of, of video content. So that's an example of how AI is helping companies to make money um, or uh, enabling monetization opportunities. Here's the detail around live facial recognition. So uh, for Sky News, for the royal wedding, uh, AI, using AI technology, you were able, we were able to do live automatic facial recognition. So as you're watching a lot of these big events, a lot of times you're wondering, oh, who are those people who are walking in? And let me, let me, I, you have to kind of think for a second or talk to the person next to you to figure out who it is or, or go on your computer to figure it out. So using AI technology, uh, AI is able to quickly kind of figure out real time who these people are and then, and then you can kind of scroll on the right. In this case, um, AI recognized Countess Spencer, who's a Canadian social entrepreneur. So here's an example of, of, of a live facial recognition. Um, and then I close with a, a video. So this is an example of AI creating marketing opportunities. So there's a TV show called Gotham, and it takes place over several years. And what, what the Gotham folks wanted to do was um, get a kind of a montage of the actor over, over the several years of the video of the, of the series. So, if a person was to do that, it would have taken several weeks for that to happen. But in this case, using AI technology, the AI technology just quickly found the faces, and it just took a couple days to kind of put this video together. So I'll close with this. Yep, so that's, that's a little bit about it. And I did want to say one thing about SEMTI, as also someone who's, uh, who's very active in, in industry organizations, I think um, 
organizations like this are, are really critical, um, especially those of you who are students. Um, I've been very involved in different organizations over the years, and it's played a key role in, in my career. But also, I've made a lot of really good friends, and, and I've also recruited my friends into different in industry organizations. So I just kind of wanted to, to echo that sentiment. Um, and I, I hope, in addition to, to learning tonight, that you may, may get involved with SMPTE. So um, that's, that's it for me for tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Gloria, for demystifying AI. And I've got to bring the mic back. Huh? <laughs> uh, and next up, we have Cliff, Cliff Lavallee, director of Louvre Studio Services at TFO. Cliff has been working with uh, support from global tech companies on reinventing the production process for TFO's digital educational resources. Thus was born the very first virtual studio using game-changing 3D technology to create dynamic video content, the Louvre. My passion is bringing people and technology together to solve a problem and provide a solution. After two and a half years and two international awards, including Amsterdam's IBC awards, the Louvre is still a buzz in the industry and Cliff, along <coughs> with his team, now specialize in offering its services to content creators from corporate videos to major productions. With 29 years in technology and media services, Cliff has led production teams, engineers, and broadcast technologists on innovative projects with international recognition. Please welcome Cliff Lavallee. Thanks, Rick. Last time I was in this room, I was introduced as the director of Love Services, and it went off a little differently, so you got it right, Rick. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, the Louvre uh, is a laboratoire d'univers virtuel. It's a virtual universe laboratory. It's basically a virtual set studio based on uh, gaming technology. Uh, we did this, uh, like Rick was saying, about three years ago. And uh, recently, we have also started to commercialize uh, our space. Uh, what's uh, unique about taking that technology and bridging it to broadcast is the, uh, that the, the worlds that we work in are very interactive. So you're, you, you take a, a subject which is in a green screen space, and when you drop them inside uh, that gaming engine, they become an asset in the space. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'll, I will uh, do a general overview, and then I also brought a friend here, which I'll introduce shortly. Uh, just a little bit on TFO. So uh, we reach uh, about 8 million households in Canada. We have uh, two silver uh, YouTube buttons with over a billion views. Uh, we also have uh, 1.9 million subscribers on 22 of our channels. And uh, another interesting point is uh, one of our mandates being educational. Uh, Idelo uh, is our online platform, which has over 12 million uh, content, uh, which uh, is, uh, well uh, represents the uh, Ontario curriculum. So that's uh, a little bit of the numbers uh, from TFO, which is uh, where we created the Louvre is in the uh, TFO, which is the public broadcaster, uh, French one in Ontario. So uh, in 2016, uh, we introduced this gaming technology, and uh, it was well received. I believe back in 2017, we hosted a SIMT event at our location, and uh, the tech, what we do hasn't changed, but we've uh, brought it uh, forward. There's a lot of uh, things that Jerry will talk about shortly about. Uh, how, how lighting has improved, how we were able to bring more to, to the stage with lighting, and also uh, some of the tracking technologies that we've added recently. Uh, the new tracking technology is actually is able to track uh, the person in the space. So you're walking around in this 3D environment, and it, I, it knows where you are in 3D. So you can do a lot with that, and we'll talk about that soon. <coughs> Let's see, I'm not in charge of the uh, web guys where we work, so hopefully the website comes up. There we go. Um, so this is the new TFO website for the Louvre. Uh, just wanted to talk a bit about the tracking. So uh, as I mentioned, the cameras and the talents are tracked. So when you're in our studio, uh, all the cameras are tracked. We have three cameras in our studio that each have a graphics engine associated to it. So you have this virtual uh, environment, one on each camera. And every camera has tracking uh, devices. So as the camera moves around, uh, the graphics are 
automatically adjusted in real time to represent like if you were in a real studio. So that's one of the, we, we reuse two of those technologies, one on a jib camera and two on pedestal cameras. So this always keeps your, uh, the, 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 um, the perspective in, in the right uh, position. So as, you're, as, as, as if you were in a real studio with uh, real hard sets, everything moves in real time. The, one of the big benefits of this gaming engine is the real time factor. So being able to do live production and uh, real time rendering uh, saves you in post render time and post production. The uh, other thing that uh, is really remarkable with what we're using is the keyer. The keyer is uh, very uh, sensitive to uh, detail. So the, the difference between what a traditional keyer would do, we, we would pick a one green color on the wall. So you, you would pick something off your green wall uh, and that color would be what you would work around as the parameter to create this chroma key cutout. Now what we do is we grab a full image of the green wall and it takes into consideration all the nuances of green. So you don't, you know, the lighting director's nightmare is having an uneven green wall. What we've been able to do now is not worry so much about the little differences in green and really, you know, our floor, which is Roscoe flooring, doesn't match our green wall, but we get away with it, it's, it's super clean. Uh, so the pros, as I was saying earlier, the talent integration. So things like uh, shadows and reflections, uh, being able to use virtual lighting and real lighting together to get the scene uh, to look the way uh, you want it to look and, and not have uh, as, uh, as high costs in, uh, in lighting. So you can do a lot of virtual lighting and then you bring in the additional lighting to make it a little bit more uh, realistic. We, we, we uh, started off with a very flat lighting. This is how we started like three years ago. And it was just accepted that, you know, that's how we were working and we didn't necessarily uh, understand all the virtual side of it back then. Because it was, we were the first in the world to use this technology. And we actually worked with a company from Turkey to build up the uh, technology. And uh, we've worked on lighting, we've worked on really getting it to where you'll see in a few minutes uh, where it is today. Uh, freedom for design. So the ability to create an environment that, you know, you're in space, you're uh, underground. We have a show where we're, we're like ants underground or something. This crazy stuff that the creators uh, come up with. Well, we were able to open up that, that space for them, open their minds and allow them to really go beyond uh, what a hard set would lock them into. So the building a hard set in a studio, you have like setup time, you have teardown time, and you have limitations. You can't go beyond that environment. So now, with, in the green space and in the virtual world, like we're using, uh, within like 10 minutes, you're switching to a new environment. Uh, so in a day, you can do multiple sets or uh, someone comes in and wants to do something in the morning and in the afternoon, it's different. There's zero tear down and setup time. It's all happening uh, within that day. Uh, live production, real-time rendering. So the ability to go live, we do some live stream stuff, doing it virtual, and it's Everything's benchmarked. We have, I think, Alfred's in here somewhere. Alfred. So he, he keeps us uh, within the guidelines. You know, Simti, longtime member, he keeps us within the uh, benchmarking. So when we uh, create our sets and when we talk about color, we all have to meet uh, these requirements. Otherwise, he, he comes down on us and slaps us. So uh, we, uh, we end up with uh, staying within what the engine can handle because we're not pushing the limits on the polygon count. We're staying within the very uh, restricted area in order to be able to get that performance of the live, live graphics engine. Uh, cost savings, kind of what I've mentioned is not having to uh, do as much post-production with this kind of technology, no rendering time, and then sets which would traditionally, for us, I think we were about 100,000, but it's not abnormal to hear millions of dollars and some of the uh, broadcasters that play for these uh, hard sets. So we're sitting at around oh, 6000 to $12,000 of costs to build these sets instead of the 100000 So there's, a, there's some uh, cost savings to have. The hardware limitations. So software, as we know, they always want to do this, this, and they can. But when you bring it back to hardware, uh, you have to respect what the, your video card can handle, what your, your system can handle. So just like recently, we got the RTX 8000 cards in our graphics uh, system, and we're able to 
push the limits on uh, ray tracing technology, which I won't get into because I don't understand it. Well, I, I know what it does, but I'm not going to explain it. Um, and we're always, as we move forward, as hardware grows, we're able to take out the software uh, capabilities to, and push it even further. Uh, now, Jerry, um, I, we, we shot a promo not too long ago. We had some help from a friend who, uh, you can guess what he did on our, uh, on our promo. Uh, Rick was helping us out with some lighting. Uh, and Jerry, he's our VFX specialist. He's been with us since the beginning of the Louvre. And uh, he was working on this uh, product when we, uh, when we uh, shot it. And he, he's really been a key factor in pushing the lighting and being able to really use tools like the uh, new tracking technology he's going to talk about. And if you're lucky, maybe he'll even drop a joke that we, we find him pretty funny sometimes, or boring. All right. Well, now he set me up for a joke, so I feel the obligation to <laughs> tell you a wonderful joke. Let's just say this, uh, this one time I sent some videotapes to, to a video editor, and I thought to myself, hmm, we'll fix it by post. Is that a bad joke? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now this can only go up from here. So uh, my name is Jerry. I'm a <laughs> VFX uh, technician. So uh, when we started out about three, four years ago at Deleuve, um, I saw there were some great opportunities uh, to play with brand new technology at TFO. And that's really what brought me here. Because um, I was hearing a lot of talk about uh, virtual set technology and, and uh, the how uh, green screen environments were kind of evolving and how things kind of uh, uh, were coming together. And uh, what was great there and, and some of the more interesting challenges is that this is all brand new, it's all very shiny, you can do a lot of beautiful, great visual effects, but at the same time there's like no documentation whatsoever on how to get there. <laughs> so, you know, you get these basic trainings, which we did. We, we had about like a three, four days of training on, on how the technology kind of works. But then after that, you got to figure out creative ways to just kind of like transform that into something that, you know, that, that's creative, but it's also a good use of the technology and also create workflows so that you're efficient and you're creating things that are, you know, interesting. So um, what I'll present to you today is uh, kind of a video we worked on recently uh, back in December when we were working on uh, the whole rebranding of the Louvre as, as well as the, from the website all the way to just, you know, image and everything. And as uh, Cliff mentioned earlier, we're working with Rick and uh, a wonderful team of creative uh, people at TFO that were just, <laughs> which is kind of funny because people come into the studio and then they come in with these ideas and whatever. And this time around, we really wanted to push things. So uh, Kennedy, who ended up directing the video, uh, came over to me and said, I want something really dramatic. I'm like, OK, we can do that, but how dramatic? It's like, like no lighting whatsoever. <laughs> and I'm kind of like panicking inside. Because <laughs> uh, my job in the Louvre is essentially to handle all the compositing. So basically, what happens is that I get a virtual set that comes in with a bunch of 3D assets. And I bring in these 3D assets together and I animate some of it and then I layer things on top of each other. And when you're working with 3D um, virtual and video game technology in particular, it's not like traditional green screen where in traditional, in traditional green screen what you're doing is you're just putting, you're removing the green and essentially layering like you would in Photoshop, the top layer on top of the rest. In this particular case, what we're doing is that we're making this video feed or this camera feed into a 3D asset that's basically obeying all the rules of the video game, right? So if there's lighting effects and all sorts of things, it'll just kind of obey those rules. Uh, so I'll show you the video, and then I'll just kind of get into it and how we built some of these, effect, these, these effects and whatnot. And uh, yeah, so let's see. This should send me to, where's the keyboard? Oh, there it is. You have to go in the folder on the desktop. Uh, on the desktop, yeah. I don't know where the keyboard is. So. Ah, it's right there. Ah. In the other room. <laughs> In the other room. <laughs> All right. So it should be on the desktop. Oh, by Gush. Ah, there it is. Look at that. It'd be this one, right? Yeah. There. Start from the beginning. Thank you. 
flexibility. Right at the tips of your fingers. Technology so advanced that we are now limited only by our creativity. Let's make something extraordinary. So what's particular about everything you see there is that everything's done in real time. Uh, so basically, walk into the studio, we obviously have a script and we have a, you know, a plan of what we're doing and everything, uh, but essentially when you walk out, you get your end result in your hands. As opposed to, you know, in traditional green screen, you're shooting the green screen, then you're taking it to post-production, and then you're adding all these uh, visual effects afterwards, right? So um, the reason, and where's the, oh, there it is. Don't use PowerPoint very often. There you go. Um, so the reason I was panicking when they were saying we want to do something really dramatic is because what it is essentially is that the green screen needs to be lit. <laughs> In order for me to be able to remove the green, I need to be able to see the green, right? Um, so what you're seeing there, this is shot in front of a green screen. Everything is black in the background because we removed all the green, but this is very low light. As you can see the light on her face, there's a very uh, distinct, uh, and that's all Rick's uh, wonderful work, um, where he's placing lights very strategically to get that nice, um, that nice contrast going, right? Because in the scenario, we're actually, you know, in a cave, right? Uh, so the idea was to start off with something really dark and not being able to tell, okay, where are we? And then kind of move on to kind of like the next image where you're like, oh, we're in a cave, right? Um, so again, in the original footage and everything, um, we've actually put... Track, we've got trackers on all our cameras, so every camera movement is tracked. So as the camera moves around the talent, everything's tracked and calculated in real time. All this information is coming in and being merged in with the, uh, with the video, right? And then we really want to put, push the technology even further. So what we did is we actually brought on the camera, uh, which is a jib in this particular case, onto the green screen. And we kind of had a, like a 360 motion around the talent as I was triggering in real time uh, the whole cave crumbling around her, right? Um, so what's wonderful about this is that you're in an environment, but there's also monitors in our studio. So the talent is actually reacting to what's actually being triggered in that environment. So back then, the way I used to do it is we used to put a piece of tape on the green and kind of say, OK, pretend this is a rock that's falling. And then just kind of like, okay, well, we'll give you a count, and then you just kind of react when you want to. And then in post-production, we'll do our best to kind of line this up and just kind of hope for the best that you're looking in the right direction because, say, there was a monster and you're looking there. Um, you can't, you know, if you're looking in the wrong direction, then I got to move the monster there, and then it gets complicated, that sort of thing, right? Um, so with this kind of thing, you can actually see the end result right there. And it's a lot easier for the talent, and you're also getting much better performance from the talent. Um, so yeah, which brings us to the next shot where we wanted something really wide and dramatic. Uh, what's really fun here is that we're actually, if you look at the original footage, we're off shooting the studio by a whole lot. So again, back then you're doing green screen, you're only shooting within that green environment, right? With our technology, we're zooming all the way out. And this essentially means that even if I'm shooting the grid or I'm seeing around the, the green, I can do the same thing as I would do in After Effects or Photoshop and just mask out the areas I don't want to show, right? So we're creating the illusion of a much bigger studio uh, than, than the space we're actually shooting in. So what's interesting and a lot of fun here, and we really want to push the limits of, uh, of what we could do. Um, so what we did there is uh, we worked with Black Tracks. And Black Tracks has developed these uh, tracking sensors that have a, a bunch of different uses. And one of them uh, being, uh, you know, an integration with virtual sets. So what we did in particular here, and you can't tell because, you know, the trackers are actually so small and, you know, our, our team is just really efficient at just placing them uh, correctly. Uh, but essentially there's a tracker on her foot. And as she steps forward, all the water... Um, ripple effects that you're seeing there, they're being triggered in real time. So we didn't animate any of this in post-production, right? So every step she's taking, uh, we've calibrated those sensors. There's one on each foot, 
Every time she's taking a step, there's a water effect, right? Um, so this saves us like a whole lot of time in post-production because then you'd have to do this frame by frame. And yeah, that makes me sad. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what's great afterwards is we really want to maximize as much as we could. So all these particle effects there, those lighting effects and, and everything. So here we have an interesting mix of um, actual real physical lighting. And we've also got a mix of virtual lighting. So all that, that glow, and you can kind of see on the right side of her, that glow is kind of affecting her uh, jacket. And then on the left side, we're dealing with real light, so that, that blue uh, light is actually a real physical light. But also, there's a tracker hidden on her hand right there. So as she's walking forward and she, she swings her hand forward, the particles are reacting to that tracker. So, so what's great there is that she moves her hand forward, the particles kind of disperse in a... In a, in a manner, and then we kind of like program it uh, so forth according to the rules we want to create for, for that kind of environment. So again, that's the fun part about working in a video game engine. You're kind of creating a world, and then you're saying, okay, gravity is this much, and then uh, particle effects do this, and then when there's a you know, lens flare or a bloom effect, this is what it looks like, right? And then you can kind of tweak those, uh, those, uh, those effects until you have what you really want. Um, this, was, um, this one I like to, to show in particular again, because as you notice in the video, the light was kind of moving around and everything. So it really helps to get that, that integration. So over the years, we've just been playing a lot and doing a lot of different projects and, and whatnot. And uh, we found that the, the best way to create a good integration is really a mix of uh, real lighting within the studio. Um, basically virtual lighting within the, the video game engine, but also color grading uh, within the engine. So I was actually uh, grading a lot of it um, in, in pre-production in the sense that we prepare all our, our color grading effects in advance, and then when it's time to shoot, I'm just loading presets according scene by scene. Okay, we're shooting this scene. Okay, here's the preset for that one. Uh, we want the blues to look a little more like this. And what was great too is I'm getting instant feedback, so I'm constantly running between the studio and the control room, and I'm talking to Rick and asking, hey, uh, I've noticed you added a little more blue here. Uh, come take a look through my monitor, and I just want to know if I'm like taking away too much of it or I'm adding too much. Is the saturation okay? Is this the mood and feel you were looking for, or am I going in a different direction than, than, than you are, right? And, and that's huge. Because oftentimes, like, everybody's kind of an artist in a creative space, right? So oftentimes, the, cinema, the cinematographer will actually do something, and then the post-production guy might go their complete different direction, right? So it's just like, if these guys don't talk to each other, or if the team just in general doesn't talk to each other creatively, uh, some of these effects can be lost. But what's great is when you're doing it in real time, you're getting the end result right there, and then you're making sure that everybody's happy with the end result. So yeah, and then kind of like the, the last effect, this is more of a wider shot where you're seeing all these particles. Um, things can be layered uh, within that space, so she can be in front of those particles, just like she can be in between them, which is why you're seeing that uh, big particle behind her. Uh, so we can define in 3D space where the talent is, uh, is actually physically. And what's great is with the black tracks uh, trackers we were using, you can actually define like as a person can walk around a pillar or something just concrete. So. That's a lot of fun, and it's, it's so much better for the talent as well, because again, they can see the end result and, and all that. So yeah, and then same kind of effect here. You're getting bloom effect, uh, virtual lighting, and uh, real physical lighting. So thank you very much, and uh, yeah. Just one more thing I wanted to show before we go here. How we feel feel uh, sad not to show it, so. So uh, one of the interesting uh, uses of the uh, virtual environment is augmented reality as well. Uh, with augmented, you are putting objects in foreground in a real set. So you're not using the green screen anymore. You're in a real environment, and you're doing uh, augmented reality. As most people know now, augmented is pretty popular. But what we've done is we've been doing a virtual interview uh, promo, which shows how we can take someone in a green space that's in another area and someone in our space, bring them together, and they look like they're standing side by side having a conversation. Uh, so the use of that when, you know, award shows, 
people can't show up to accept their prizes. They can be on stage virtually. I think we've seen some examples where Madonna has been reproduced like eight times on the stage, uh, things like that. Uh, RDA, not actually here, by the way. <laughs> RDS uh, uses it for their Latsham, which is their um, hockey uh, post show. They actually use uh, of some similar type of effect. I'll just play it down so you guys can see it somewhere. Just let it roll. So here you see this, the host is in studio. There's not nobody there. Um, two different setups. So we set up monitors so they can see eyeline. Fairly simple to do. Uh, the green screen is. Uh, like I said, it's uneven, unevenly lit, so you can have like uh, you can set up in behind a stadium somewhere with a green sheet and uh, lock off the camera, pipe that back to the studio, and you're not too worried about the green because the chroma keyer can handle that uneven green. So that's just something else I wanted to make sure to put in there because I think it's it's going to change how we do double enders where you have someone in a monitor. Now you can actually have someone standing beside you on in the space. Thank you. What, what Cliff was trying to say is they worked it out so they no longer need me to light the space, that's all. <laughs> so, um, to finish off this wonderful evening of uh, education, we are fortunate to have with us Mary Ellen Carlisle, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Dome Productions. With 34 years of experience, Mary Ellen began her career in 1985 with uh, the Sports Network, TSN, and joined Dome Productions as an original employee back in 1989 in the role of Manager of Operations. As Senior Vice President and General Manager at Dome, Mary Ellen currently leads one of North America's largest production services companies with its integration of mobile production, host broadcast services, master control, crewing and transmission services, all under the corporate umbrella. Mary Ellen has been instrumental in leading the way in the rollout of 4K production in North America. And under Mary Ellen's guidance, Dome Productions became the very first production mobile vendor in North America to launch 4K with an NBA Toronto Raptors broadcast live to the home in Canada on January 20th, 2016. And she also spearheaded Dome's groundbreaking involvement into the esports video gaming space. Mary Ellen has overseen Dome's mobile and production facilities, engineering, technical management, live signal distribution, and personnel. Mary Ellen has managed such prestigious events as the 2008, uh, 2008 IIHF World Hockey Championships, many IIHF World Junior Hockey Championships, the 2010 Vancouver Winter Olympics, the 2000, <laughs> sorry? We're good. We're good. Okay. It goes on for a while, by the way. But, however, I do have to say this, in recognition, in recognition of her achievements and groundbreaking career in sports television, Mary Ellen was inducted into the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Fame in New York in December of 2019, the first Canadian ever inducted into this hall. Welcome, Mary Ellen. You guys hanging in there? <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to thank Simpty and Ryerson for letting me talk tonight, so I appreciate that. I always have uh, lots of time for students. And this, uh, this chat is really for the students, um, so it's not, it's not too technical. Um, one thing I would say right off the bat, and I tell all my um, employees, the first thing that you should um, take right out of a title is broadcast. I would say that we're no longer a broadcast industry, we're a media industry. So that's uh, one of the things that I guide our s staff on. I'm going to talk uh, um, about a few things. Um, number one, the shifting uh, landscape. Um, my technologies that is very close to my heart is 4K and HDR and AI. I'm very uh, thrilled on HR AI coming. Um, E-gaming and e-sports and the sports rights um, changing that's going to happen in our career. 
So the shifting landscape, every three decades, um, roughly a generation, media has experienced a major shift. 1920s, we went from the silent film to the talkies. 1950s, we went into broadcast television. And when I was sitting where you guys were sitting, the cable boom was happening. Um, I want my MTV. The broadcasters were terrified of the cable guys. Um, now, the shift is happening again. It's the long um, promised revolution, online streaming. Again, the broadcasters are scared. TV viewing, they say, is declining faster than anticipating, but that's actually not true. You guys are just changing your viewing habits. No longer are you watching a TV, but you're still watching video content. And almost a quarter of the Canadians between the ages of 18 and 34 have switched to online services. The smartphone's getting faster, and you're watching TV out of the home. You're watching all your content out of the home. The TV broadcasters have to make that switch from broadcasting, which used to be appointment viewing. I actually had to run home and watch uh, my TV. Dallas was my show at the time, at 8 o'clock on a Friday night. Then I got the VCR, so that was pretty cool. I could go out on a Friday night. And now you guys can watch it anytime, anywhere. As you know, Netflix started in 2017, and it, they went from a DVD service to a streaming service, and they're now spending over $12 billion in content. Disney, Warner, and uh, NBC, they were not jumping into the streaming right away because they had legacy um, channels that they didn't want to give up the monetization on. But Disney's a pretty smart company, and in 2017, 2017 Disney paid a billion dollars for a company called BamTech, which was a small tech company that brought HBO to the streaming. They went on to create Disney Plus and ESPN Plus. So although Disney may be seen as behind Netflix, I think they had that strategy all around. Warner, HBO, NBC, they have thousands and thousands of hours, and it's old content and new content. Disney Plus launched on November 12th. It now has over 28 million subscribers. And the cost is less than a popcorn, large popcorn in the theaters. So it makes you think, are people going to take their families to the theaters and go through the hassle of putting the kids in the car, buying the tickets, getting the popcorn, or are they going to sit back and take an experience where they can be in their own living room, make their own popcorn, and actually have Uber Eats? The future trends, the middleman's gone. Cable systems, operators, the cinemas. Studios are starting to release fewer movies to the theaters. Instead, they're going directly to streaming services. One example is Melissa McCarthy's Super Intelligent was to be released in theaters this December, and it's now being held on for HBO Max in April. Do you think one day that the Oscars and the Emmys will be combined? Money is being thrown at people and ideas and scripts at a level that's never happened before in Hollywood. Business models are changing. Studios are paying money up front as opposed to residuals, where the repeats happen. Streaming ser services are also starting to change, and it hasn't been that long. But they're starting a thing called drip feed, which is the new content comes once a week, as opposed to binge viewing. But as students, one thing you have to know, lots of opportunities out there. You can make content because people need it. Is it getting crowded? You overwhelmed with all the streaming services? I think what's going to happen is we're going to go back to what happened in the cable boom. We're going to find that we can't afford a la carte. We're going to be paying $4.95 a month for each um, streaming service, and we want to get all of our content. So you're going to start seeing the streaming service bundles, whether they're the a la carte bundles, whether they're the skinny bundles, or whether it's all in. And I think what you're going to see is Companies like Rogers and Bell are going to offer you your monthly internet, and they're going to put a bundle together. You're already starting to see that shift with Amazon. They have a la carte TV. And it's inevitable that most streaming service will start with two tiers, one that has no commercials and one with ads. And you're starting to see that with Amazon. 
Technology, I'm a firm believer that those that accept technology that gives the viewer a better experience will be the front runners. I'm a big believer in 4K and HDR, and I'm very um, fortunate that our owners, Bell Media and Rogers Media, allowed us to launch 4K in um, 2016. We've currently facilitated 955 events, and we're expecting to hit 1,000 by April. As late as December 2017, I sat on a panel, and the American networks were saying, it doesn't make sense to go to 4K due to the ecosystem, and we probably never will. However, I believe the 4K HDR streaming service, such as Apple TV and Amazon, are going to force the broadcasters to produce in the highest quality available. And now they have a distribution system for 4K. Unlike its partner Disney, ESPN Plus has launched, but they didn't launch with any 4K original programming. However, they do know they need to have 4K programming in order to be in the sports business. So this past uh, fall, they um, did six um, college football games in 4K and they just did the um, football national championship on DirecTV. Fox streaming services, Fox Now and Fox Sports allowed them to be the, produce the first 4K HDR Super Bowl after their Thursday night lessons learned on their broadcast. They had a lot of trouble with the HDR side. Some people say it's not true 4K, it's 1080p upconvert, but I believe 4K native will come to them. Dome has done a handful of um, 4K HDR projects, thanks to our Director of Engineering, Mike Johnson. And we're going to continue this um, end of the month. We're going to do Burton Snowboarding in 4K HDR, which will go on DirecTV. And we've been uh, commissioned to do the Tokyo Olympics Beach Volleyball in HD 4K. It's not going away. It's only going to come back. Grow in numbers. AI. Um, I pr it promises to transform the media and the entertainment business, impacting everything from content creation to the consumer experience. AI could revolutionize live broadcasting and impact the way the audience views sports. An AI camera, as the Gloria said, it teaches itself. So you put a soccer ball in front of it and you keep that AI camera there for 41 soccer games, 400 soccer games, it's going to learn that game. It's going to know where that ball is supposed to go. An AI director can actually have the events on the field, learn the game, and start automatically choosing the right camera to display the viewer on the viewer screen. It actually can automatically do subtitles for live events if they know which language it should be in and where it's going. It's not happening yet, but it's coming. AI may be able to produce highlights, may be able to use the elements of the home and away color jerseys, crowd noise, location of the ball on the field of play. <clears throat> Think about an AI cutting your graphic, uh, your highlights, and they have the Toronto Raptors highlights based on the black shirt, and they have the Lakers highlights based on the white shirt. Streaming services needs more content. AI can assist in getting those lower tier sports which don't have the big um, budgets and get them to the audience. By connecting stadiums, fields, gyms, complex, AI automated production services can bring fans closer to the game. And it can also be used to identify the right opportunities to present ads, enabling the broadcasters to effectively utilize monetization opportunities through ad sales. So, for example, it could find out that you were in Montreal and put a Montreal ad in there. In the early, that's enough about AI, in the early um, 2019, Netflix CEO Reed Hastings told shareholders what he thought the company's stiffest competition was. Wasn't HBO, wasn't Disney, wasn't Amazon, wasn't TV, wasn't the movie theaters. In his estimation, the greatest threat to Netflix continued dominance in the entertainment was the video game Fortnite. E-gaming, once a niche pastime, has secured its place in the mainstream media. 
The gaming industry generated 120 billion revenue in 2019 and expected to go up to 200 in the next two years. 100 million viewers watched the e-game championship of League of Legends. By 2021, it's projected that there will be 2.7 billion gamers. That's approximately a third of the world's population. Apple, Google, and Amazon are all developing gaming products for their streaming services. Dome jumped into eSports. So there's e-gaming and the eSports. The eSports is actually playing a video game live competitively in front of an audience. We jumped into eSports in 2016 and we haven't stopped. According to Deloitte, 40% of the gamers watch eSports events once a week and 25% of that 40% watch four hours a week. Esports is taking the audience share away from regular sports. Tournaments have considerable cash prizes. The League of Legends in 2018, the top prize was $14 million, way more than what Tiger made at the Masters. The media rights are expected to grow from 340, sorry, they went from 295 in 2016 to they're expected to be 340 million this year. As media and gaming right worlds, gaming worlds continue to converge, broadcast and media rights will be the key growth for esports. Similar to how traditional sports are built, like the NFL, the NBL, the NHL, North America esports is following the same trend with limited membership and selling of both national and regional lights, they're buying franchises. Many NBA, NFL, and MLB owners are in prime position to secure franchises. The New England Patriots owner bought an Overwatch League franchise for over $45 million. Other well-known figures in traditional sports, from traditional sports investing in esports is Shaq O'Neal and Magic Johnson. So one um, company close to our hearts at Dome is Blizzard Entertainment. They control the Overwatch um, League and Call of Duty, Call of Duty being the most popular game. Overwatch League expanded from, uh, uh, to 20 teams this year, 10 in the Atlantic Conference and 10 in the Pacific Conference. Last year they played in a studio. This year they're going on the road, home and away. 28 matches and they'll visit each team city They'll have an all-star game, and they'll have finals. Overwatch League negotiated multi-million dollar contracts with ESPN, TSN in Canada, Amazon's Twitch. Their major sponsors are now Coca-Cola, Intel, and Toyota. <coughs> Call of Duty, consisting of 12 teams from four countries, launched last month. It's a shorter season than Overwatch, and will stream solely on Twitch. There were whispers that in 2024 Olympics, there will be esports as a demonstration sport. In the next uh, um, two to three years, uh, there's going to be a huge changing of the rights. Um, they're expecting that these rights, sporting rights, the NBA, the NFL, MLB, NHL, will grow 75% in terms of paying for the rights. It's the first time ever that the OTTs will be able to bid on these big rights. And it's not if they will bid, it's when they will bid. Most of the deals for the NFL, the NBL, and the NHL will end in 2021. And some of the tech giants have deeper pockets than some of the um, broadcasters. Apple's been exploring as late as um, just, just uh, recently in December. They've been meeting with uh, the Pac-12 and looking at the college sports rights. It doesn't mean that we're going to not see rights on ESPN and uh, Fox. Those rights go till 2024. But these will be additional games, which means, again, more content. The launch of ESPN Plus is to believe to be a strategic initiative of Robert Agar that will raise the stakes of securing sports content. Hence, the rights will go up. At the front of the pack, the report cites the US technology giant Amazon as the most significant game changer in the field today. This is one that really intrigues me is Amazon. They've already required the rights for the English Premier League. 
They did a deal for Thursday night football. They did a deal for AVP volleyball. And they said that they could probably bid up to three million, and I think that's supposed to be three billion, so I apologize on that, on the Monday night football package and take it away from ESPN. Amazon can bundle on an optional sports package on Amazon Prime. They could put it on IM. DB TV, which they have ads on, so they've already figured out the commercial insertion. They have all your personal data from e-commerce, your streaming services, your Alexa system. So think of this as a personal experience. You're watching your favorite NFL game. Your merchandise ad comes on with a Dallas Cowboys jersey. Alexa knows that you're a fan. She asks you, would you like to order one? with your delivery of the jersey arriving before the end of the game. Oh, and by the way, you could have Whole Foods for halftime snacks. Which leads me to, and you're going to hear this more and more and more, personalization is where we're going to go. Personalization has the potential to drive significant revenues for those forward-thinking media companies that are set up to be, set up to be um, able to use your audience <laughs> Traditional broadcasters are not set up in this way. They could be if they're forward thinking. Media companies can leverage AI through their content supply chain to automate operations, drive decision making, and personalize their consumer. The consumers are increasingly willing to provide personal information about themselves if they can get a better experience and the majority of advertising will be spent in this area as advertisers are looking for greater audience, target availability, and cheaper rates. So that's my story. Whether it's true or not, I'm not sure. 